I am Fabiola. I'm the Education Manager at the Law Foundation. Law Foundation runs Law Week and we're always very excited to run Law Talks during Law Week. I'm now going to um, pass you over to Shirley from the Leo Cusson Centre for Law, our very wonderful hosts and co-event partners for today. So please welcome Shirley to the stage. Thank you. Good morning. Can people hear me? I don't think that's working, never mind. Welcome. Very, very pleased to be able to welcome you all here to Leo Cousin for the Law Talk today. We meet on the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and I would like to pay my respects to their elders past and present, and to any other elders that might be joining us in the room today. You've got a fabulous program set up for you. Lots of opportunity to ask lots of people questions. I'd encourage you to do that. So I'm going to start then by introducing your first speaker for today. You're very lucky and we're very happy to welcome Rob Hulls to come and present to you. Rob has uh, a long and illustrious career in the law. Uh, he's worked for the Legal Aid Commission in Victoria, for Queensland Aboriginal Legal Aid. He's been a federal politician, a state politician. He's been the Attorney General here. He's made some significant contributions to law reform, particularly for Victoria and establishing significantly the first Charter of Human Rights. So it's something that we need to understand and understand in the context in which we work, and that's a terrific thing for us. At the moment, Rob is now an adjunct professor at RMIT uh, in the Centre of Innovation. I hope he's going to tell us a little bit more about that, but please join me in welcoming Rob Hulls. Uh, thanks very much, Shirley. Uh, welcome, guys. Great to have you all here. I suppose you had to be here, really. Didn't have much choice, but uh, it is great to have you. I also want to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet and pay my respects to their elders past and present. I also want to acknowledge uh, former Supreme Court Judge Phil Cummins, who is uh, here with us this morning, and he'll be speaking to you a bit later on about law reform, how it works, and how it can make a real difference to people's lives. So all you guys are legal study students, is that right? Hands up those who want to go on and study law. Some. Hands up those who have uh, probably been told by family or friends that they're not good enough to do law, that their marks won't be good enough, it's too hard to get into, they probably won't. Yeah, yeah same with me. When I was your age, I did... Uh, come in, guys. Welcome. You've missed the free gifts. We've all had free breakfast, bacon and eggs. You missed all that. Um, so when I was uh, your age, I did legal studies at school. And the reason I did it was because I actually wanted to know a bit about citizenship, wanted to know a bit about the law, a bit, a bit about how the law works. Um, and thought that one day I might like to practice law because I saw practicing law as uh, I might just wait for everyone to come in I think so what school is this MSC Melton, Melton. Uh, you're forgiven it's a fair way to come we all set right those who have just arrived from Melton doing legal studies, hands up those who want to do law. Hands up those from Melton who have probably been told by friends or family, look, don't bother doing law, you won't be good enough, your marks won't be good enough, you'll never get into it, it's really hard to get into. Yep, exactly. Same, exactly the same when I was your age. I wanted to do law because I saw law as... An opportunity, practicing law is an opportunity to change people's lives, to represent the most disadvantaged members of our community and make a difference in their lives. But there were plenty of people in my life who said, uh-uh, you're not smart enough, mate. You're not going to be smart enough to do law. You'll never end up being a lawyer. It's really hard. There's no jobs, even if you become a lawyer. And I thought, to be frank with you, I thought, bugger them. I'm going to really try and get into law. When I finished my school, did legal studies in year 11 and 12, but my marks 
weren't good enough to get into law and uh, they were nowhere near good enough to get into law. And a lot of those doomsayers who told me to give up on the idea were sort of saying, ha, ah, we told you so, told you Marx wouldn't be good enough, give up on that idea. And again, I thought, bugger them, I'm going to do law um, because I really want to and I want to show them that they're wrong. And so whilst my marks weren't good enough to get into law, they were good enough to get into um, first year of arts at La Trobe University. And I wasn't living anywhere near La Trobe. It was a fair way from where I was living and it was you know, a bit of a hassle getting out there each day. But whilst I was out at La Trobe, I wrote to RMIT University on a daily basis because they had a law course, a really practical law course where you worked in a lawyer's office during the day and you did lectures in the morning and at night and you could make a bit of money working in the lawyer's uh, office during the day. It wasn't a lot of money but I thought that sounds like a pretty, good, pretty practical course for me. So I wrote to RMIT on a daily basis when I was um, at La Trobe. So much so that they wrote back and said, stop stalking us. Stop writing to us on a daily basis. And I know I was stalking them because when I became Attorney General, I introduced stalking laws um, to stop that type of practice. But uh, yeah, I was stalking RMIT because I desperately wanted to get into law. They said, stop writing to us. If you pass first year arts at La Trobe, there'll be a place for you in law at RMIT. I thought, wow. And sure enough, I passed. I passed first year arts at La Trobe just by the skin of my teeth. But I got into law at RMIT. And I thought, this finally is what I want to do. I finally have got into something that I wanted to do and I will be able to make a difference once I qualify as a lawyer. Well, I found law and law studies pretty hard. Pretty hard, but uh, I finished my course and I became a qualified lawyer. So all those doomsayers who were telling me, give up on the idea of doing law, I was able to give them the two finger salute, to be frank with you. And my advice to you is those doomsayers, some of you put your hand up and said, yeah, there'll be people who'll tell you you're not good enough to do law, just ignore them, right? Just ignore them, they are wrong. If you want to do law and you have the passion and the commitment, you will be able to do it and you will be able to make a difference to people's lives. So ignore those doomsayers in your life that tell you you're not good enough to do something, whether it's law or medicine or hairdressing or teaching, whatever it is, there'll be those doomsayers who'll tell you you're not good enough, just ignore them. Have passion, commitment and work hard and you can achieve anything you want. So when I became a qualified lawyer, there were a number of uh, practices that offered me jobs. In fact, my father had a legal practice and he wanted me to take over that legal practice. But I decided I wanted to assist the most disadvantaged members of our community. So I applied for and got a job with Legal Aid and worked for Legal Aid for a while here in Melbourne out at Broadmeadows and then down at Frankston. And then I saw a job advertised working with an Aboriginal legal service in Mount Isa in North Queensland. I'd never met an Aboriginal person in my life, didn't know where Mount Isa was, knew it was a long way away, knew it was bloody hot. Um, applied for the job and got it. Well, it changed my life. I took myself outside my comfort zone, went up to Mount Isa, and I vividly remember the first day I arrived. Right? I was just a young kid, had practiced law briefly with legal aid, going up outside my comfort zone to northwest Queensland. And the plane landed and it was 42 degrees when I got out of the plane, hit me in the face. And I thought, God, what sort of heat wave are they having here? It wasn't a heat wave, it was just a normal day in Mount Isa. It's a bloody hot place. And then they put on a barbecue for me to welcome the new lawyer, new Aboriginal legal aid lawyer. And I go to this barbecue and I remember vividly a police sergeant came up to me and he said, oh mate, you're the new lawyer from Melbourne here to do Aboriginal legal aid work. I said, yeah. He said, do you know what sort of work you're gonna do? I said, oh, I'm looking forward to it, looking forward to representing the most disadvantaged members of our community. He said, mate, say if I was to tell you that last night in the Mount Isa police station, an old Aboriginal bloke was arrested for being drunk. That's all he was arrested for, just for being drunk. I said, yeah. And he said, and what if I were to tell you that the police sergeant in charge of the watch house and his mates decide to play a few games with this drunk Aboriginal bloke? and force-fed him cockroaches. I said, what? And sort of half laughed. 
And he said, you see, the reaction you've given to the story I've told, one of disbelief, half laughter, is exactly the same reaction that the magistrate will give when that Aboriginal bloke goes to court and tells the court that cockroaches were forced down his throat by the police. The magistrate won't believe him because it is unbelievable, but it happened. Mate, I saw it. I was there and that's why I'm leaving town. You've got a bloody hard job ahead of you. That was my welcome to Mount Isa as a lawyer. Well, I can tell you that I'd planned to stay there just for one year to do Aboriginal legal aid work and to come back to Melbourne. I end up staying up there for seven years, for seven years in Mount Isa, five of which, for eight years at least, five of which was doing the Aboriginal legal aid work because it was extraordinary work. I could have walked away after hearing that cockroach story, but I thought, hang on, I've got the privilege of being qualified as a lawyer, the privilege of being able to represent the most disadvantaged members of our community. I can't walk away. I've got to stay there and fight for their rights. And some of the stuff I saw, you wouldn't believe. I used to go to places, and get out a map after this and see where these places are, places like Doomagie and Normanton and Burketown up in the Gulf of Carpentaria. You know that map of Australia where that bit goes way up there and then comes down again? There's a little island right in the middle there called Mornington Island. I used to visit those types of places. And the stories I heard from my clients who were supposed to be getting fair, independent justice was extraordinary. On a regular basis, I would take instructions from my client, right? Not in an interview room, because these remote places didn't have interview rooms. I'd sit outside under a tree to take instructions from my clients. The police officers called it the guilty tree. It was the only tree in front of the police station that offered shade. And I said, why do you call it the guilty tree? And the copper said, oh, that's because anyone who sits under that tree must be guilty of something. That was the view of the police. Right? That's the sort of justice system I was dealing with. And you take instructions from your client and they might be charged with breaking into a school and stealing food. Right? Often they were the charges. Break and enter, stealing food or stealing something to drink because they were so poor they couldn't get access to these types of things. Or breaking into a place just to get a roof over their head. And they wanted to plead guilty, so you take instructions about how old they were, about their educational background and stuff, and then a police officer would walk past and they'd say, oh, that's him. And I'd say, what do you mean that's him? He's the one who bashed me. I said, whoa, you didn't tell me that before. Yeah, he, he bashed me while he was interviewing me. And then after he interviewed me, he took me to the cells and he pissed on me. And I just couldn't believe what I was hearing. I said, what? Oh, yeah, yeah, it happens all the time. The coppers, they bash you and then they take you to the cells and then they piss on you. And I said, well, we're not pleading guilty. We're going to plead not guilty to these charges and we have to send a message that this type of behaviour cannot be tolerated in Australia. And so a number of cases, we won. We won whereby the charges of being drunk and disorderly weren't proven and our client was found not guilty. But what we then did was sue the police, take legal action against the police for assaulting our clients. And we won a very substantial case where my client mightn't see much money now, still does to me, won $20,000, $20,000 in damages because he was successful in suing the police for pissing on him, bashing him, dragging him out of the divvy van, smashing his head against the ground, dragging him into the watch house and kicking him in the watch house. And we won a civil action and our client got $20,000 worth of damages. So that sent a message to the police that no longer can you treat members of our community the way you have been treating them for years and years and years. You will be held to account. So I did that work for five years. It was bloody hard work. Often I'd go to court in an outback remote area and I'd be followed, followed back home by a police car for 50 or 60 Ks, you know, just to try and intimidate me. That's the sort of work I was doing. But I felt it was a privilege to use my law qualifications to assist these people who desperately needed help. But then I thought, well, if the laws are no good, if the laws aren't culturally sensitive, if the laws are still allowing this type of brutality to occur with Aboriginal people, how do you go about changing the law? So I decided to use my background as a lawyer to run for politics, believe it or not. And so I ran for federal parliament 
up in North Queensland. I was only 32 at the time. I know that seems old to you guys, but only 32. I ran for federal parliament and I got elected. So here I was, a guy from Melbourne, Mark's not good enough to get into law, um, did Aboriginal legal aid work, and then I find myself in federal parliament. And I used every second I had in the short time I was there, I was only there for one term, to try and improve the lot of Aboriginal people in North Queensland. Got them water. Some of those communities they lived on, 1,200 people, didn't have running water. Didn't have a dam built in their community where they could actually get water 24 hours a day. Stuff that we all take for granted. So then, as happens with most politicians, uh, I got beaten. I got beaten at the next election. And you can't tell anyone this. You're sworn to secrecy. I got beaten by a fella called Bob Catter. Probably heard of him. So I'm the one to blame for Bob Catter being in federal parliament. I apologise to everybody for that. Um, but anyway, uh, I then decided to move back to Melbourne. And politics was in my blood and I ran for parliament in Victoria and got elected and then became the Attorney General, the Chief Law Officer of the State of Victoria. And when you get sworn in as a minister, you actually go to Government House and the Governor of Victoria swears you in as a minister. Can you imagine, guys, what was going through my mind that day I got sworn in at Government House as the Chief Law Officer of the State of Victoria? All my parents were there, family were there, they were all very proud. All I could think of was, my God, my marks weren't good enough to get into law and now I'm the senior law officer of the state of Victoria. Thank God I didn't listen to those doomsayers who told me I'd never be good enough to get into law. And thank God I took myself outside my comfort zone and went up to Mount Isa and did something different and saw how unjust our justice system can be. I now have an opportunity to change the justice system in Victoria and hopefully for the better. So I used my experience in Mount Isa as a bit of a roadmap to guide everything I did as Attorney General in Victoria. One of the first things I did, and you've no doubt studied this, or if you haven't, you will, I introduced a series of Koori courts in Victoria, Aboriginal courts where you have Aboriginal elders. Anyone here been to the Koori courts? If you haven't, get the opportunity to go and sit in on a Koori court. It's an extraordinary experience where you actually have an Aboriginal elder Aboriginal respected person sitting around a table with the magistrate, with the Aboriginal defendant, with the police officer, with a whole range of support services and the whole aim is to try and stop the Aboriginal person committing further offences and the cultural context of the offending and the family background of the Aboriginal kid is spoken about at the court and the power of the elders more often than not is so strong that those Aboriginal people that go before the court never reoffend, or certainly don't reoffend at the same sort of rates as people who go before non Koori courts. It's an extraordinary experience. It works. So that was based on my experience in Mount Isa. I also introduced mental health courts here, assessment and referral court, which is a mental health court basically, because as we know, our jails are full of people who have mental health issues. You know, there's some bad buggers out there that need to be locked up for a long period of time, absolutely. But you see, as a community, we seem to have a sympathy bypass. When we watch the Channel 7 or the Channel 9 news at night and we see somebody who's a victim walk out of court, they might have lost a loved one uh, in a culpable driving matter or whatever, and the person who was the driver gets sentenced to six years jail. The camera goes on the face of the person who's lost their loved one and the first reaction of the person walking out of court who've lost a loved one is, it's not enough. Six years is not enough. I've lost the love of my life and that the offender only got six years. What the media never asks is, well, if six years isn't enough, what would be enough? Nothing's enough because the loved one's not coming back. So we have a justice system that has to treat people with respect and dignity. But then we have this compassion bypass for that person who's walked out of court, as a result of losing that loved one, they might fall into depression, they might become an alcoholic or a drug user, they might lose their job, they might lose their house, and as a result, they then tip over and become an offender themselves. 
and we say, bugger them, lock them up and throw away the key, without understanding the background behind the offending. And our jails are full of those types of people. They're full of people who have mental health issues, who have drug and alcohol issues, who have been victims of family violence. Did you know that something like 80%, 80% of women in our female prisons have themselves been victims, some stage in their life, of sexual or family violence? We're locking these people up. There's just got to be a better way. So I introduced a whole range of therapeutic restorative courts, mental health court, family violence court, neighbourhood justice centre, which is a one-stop justice shop, where under the one roof there's a court, but there's also alcohol and drug services, there's housing services, there's mental health services, so people who go to court can get linked into those services on the one day. Um, so therapeutic restorative justice is really, in my view, the way of the future. Otherwise, as a community, we'll end up spending more money on prison beds than school classrooms or hospital beds. And I'm sure that's not the sort of community you guys want to live in. So I then retired from politics, um, as uh, often happens with people who decide they get a bit old for, for the game. I got out of the time of my choosing, and then I got a phone call from RMIT University, where I did my law. They said, we'd like you to come back in some capacity. We'd like to make you an adjunct professor and I said, what the bloody hell's that? I didn't know what adjunct professor meant. And I said, look, I'm not interested in any particular title, but if you're fair income, I wouldn't mind trying to set up an innovative justice centre, a smart, a place where students, like you guys, can learn about smarter ways of doing justice. I've now opened up a mental health community legal centre uh, on site at RMIT, where students get the most amazing clinical education experience where they go into our female prison with social workers and lawyers and social work students and law students. They go in and they put wraparound services around female prisoners while they're in jail. So a female might be in jail for a drug offence, but while she's there, there's debts, there's family law issues, there's tenancy issues that all build up. When she gets out of jail, she's still involved in the justice system. That can lead to depression and recidivism. So this program goes in, assists female prisoners with all those legal issues and then follows them out of prison for, for six months to help them with housing and uh, help them with medical appointments and stuff. And our students go in and they open up real files on real people. It's an amazing clinical education experience for our students. We also offer an innovative justice study tour for our students, where each year I take a bunch of students to New Zealand uh, or to look at some of the courts I set up here, you go behind the scenes and see how these courts operate. You get to meet the mental health workers, you get to meet the housing workers, you sit in court and you hear what happens to the person who's going before the court and how all these services are put around them. It's an amazing experience for our students. Next year we might be going to New York uh, to go on an innovative justice study tour there. So there are a whole range of opportunities for you guys if you decide to, to, do, to do law and don't be put off by those people who say, you're not good enough. So I'll conclude on this note, because I know um, there's lots of questions you, you want to ask. There are two messages I'd leave with you, and I've mentioned them a couple of times. Don't be put off by those people in your life that say you're not smart enough to do what you, th you think you want to do. You're not smart enough to do law. Your marks will never be good enough to become a doctor, or your marks will never be good enough to become a teacher or whatever you want to do, just ignore them, right? There are a whole range of different ways you can end up doing what you want to do. And you look at me, marks were pretty ordinary at school, pretty ordinary when I was doing arts at La Trobe because I didn't like it, but still finally got into law and became the senior law officer of the state of Victoria. The second message is just from time to time, take yourself outside your comfort zone, right? Look at me, you know, white, Anglo-Saxon, male, middle-class background, never met an Aboriginal person in my life, decided, as scary as it was, I would take myself up to Mount Isa and do this scary work. Uh, and it changed my life. It totally changed my view of the justice system. It made me so passionate about wanting to change the justice system. Right? And that's because I took myself outside my comfort zone. There'll be decisions that you guys will get to make at some stage in your life where, oh yeah, I can stay at home and keep doing this and yeah, um, I can stay on the PS4 and it's pretty comfortable and 
Yeah, I'll do that. Or I can take myself outside my comfort zone and do something a bit more difficult. Take that second choice, right? Because it will make a real difference to your life as it did to me. So they're the two messages. Doomsayers, get nicked. And it's comfort zone, see you later. I'm taking myself outside my comfort zone. I have no doubt in this room there's a future Attorney General. I have no doubt in this room there's county court, Supreme Court judges, magistrates. I have no doubt in this room there's principals of schools. I have no doubt in this room there's scientists. There's brilliant opportunities for all of you. You've just got to grab it. But don't be put off by the doomsayers and take yourself outside your comfort zone. Thanks for listening, guys. And I'll try to answer any questions you might have. Don't be frightened. First question wins a car. <laughs> Funny story, at that stage my parents were living on the Mornington Peninsula at a place called Mount Martha. And I said to my father, um, I've applied for a job in Mount Isa and I'm going. And he said, what the bloody hell do you want to work in Mount Eliza for? I said, no, 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 not Mount Eliza, Mount Isa. So he had to dig out a map and see. Um, I, I, knew, I knew from um, my law and my interest in assisting disadvantaged people that Aboriginal people were and still are the most jailed race per head of population in the world. Did you know that? Per head of population, Aboriginal people in Australia are the most jailed race in the world. I knew that then and I still know that now and I thought well I've now got the privilege of being qualified as a lawyer. Who are the most disadvantaged members of our community and they were Aboriginal people and I thought how can I get some sort of experience assisting Aboriginal people and it just so happened that I was working with legal aid down in Frankston at the time and I saw a job advertised in the newspaper wanting a lawyer to work with the Western Queensland Aboriginal Legal Service. So it was my state of mind wanting to assist disadvantaged people and the coincidence of a job being advertised. And I rang up and applied for the job, not, never expecting to get it. And they rang me a week later and said, um, yeah, you got the job. Uh, and I thought, oh my God, either no one else applied uh, or uh, you know, I won't go. And I thought, no, bugger that, I'm, I'm gonna do it. And I'd only planned to do it for 12 months and it was a life-changing experience. Scary, but life-changing. Yep. Uh, good question. Um, there were a number of female lawyers who were in Mount Isa that I encouraged to do that Aboriginal court circuit with me, uh, and they cope very well. They cope very well, and uh, the clients respected them just as much as they respected me because the clients were sick and tired of the police harassment, the police brutality, and anyone who was there to try and change that, the Aboriginal clients really, really respected. Um, uh, it wasn't uh, so much of a male culture as you might expect. Um, I had a number of uh, staff. So, so I was employed by the West Queensland Aboriginal Legal Service and a large number of the employees there were women, and indeed the strength of Aboriginal communities come from their women. Um, and so there was no issue in relation to um, women working in that environment. Having said that, the law is a different beast. And when I became Attorney General, um, the law was um, predominantly, lawyers were predominantly white Anglo-Saxon blokes from private schools. And I tried to change that and appoint um, as many women to the judiciary as possible. Um, and I remember advertising positions that had never been done before. I put ads in papers saying, seeking expressions of interest for people who want to become judges. Um, in particular, I want to encourage women and people from diverse backgrounds to apply. And I can remember a, um, a particular male, one of the old school, rang me up and said, Mr Attorney, it is absolutely outrageous that you would be advertising these positions. It's never happened before. 
and I do not intend to apply to be a judge pursuant to the ads you've placed in the paper. However, Mr Attorney, if you deemed it appropriate to appoint me as a judge, I'd be more than happy to accept. Um, needless to say, I haven't, didn't appoint that person as a, uh, as a judge. Um, but it was uh, very largely a male-dominated profession, still is to a large degree. Things are changing. I appointed the first ever female Chief Justice uh, in this state, and we have a large number of female judicial officers now, and cultural change takes time, but it is changing. Up the back. Sorry, I can't hear. Is it? I, I can't hear. Well, maybe I'll get this. I think it's a microphone. Yep. Yeah. Sorry. Um, no, that's great. I that I've always wanted to become like a criminal psychologist and like I've always been like I don't know why it's weird but I've always been interested in like the reasons why like people kill um why am I stuttering like people kill people um yeah you basically get my question so yeah, yeah. you know what I mean so so, so um let, let me give you an example of how people oh, have you. a one-sided view of the law okay if you that, that's your question, the fact that you want to become a criminal psycholo psychologist? Okay, very, very interesting career path, and you will achieve it. If that's what you want, you will achieve it, right? Absolutely, you will. But I've spoken to uh, school classes before, and you know, people have this sort of myopic, one-sided view of the justice system without wanting to do what you want to do, and that is have a look at why people are committing offences. So let me give you an example. Hands up those in this room who think someone who kills another person kills another person should automatically go to jail. A few hands, of course, of course there's a few hands. Uh, often there's more hands, often there's more hands than that. Like someone who kills another person, should they go to jail? Yes, yes, okay, what about this situation? Designated driver, 19 years of age, he's driving the car, his mates are pissed in the back of the car, they're um, mucking around, he turns around, um, to tell them to stop mucking around, he momentarily loses concentration, slams into a tree and kills his two mates in the back of the car. He may be charged with culpable driving uh, and if he was convicted he might go to jail for six years. Hands up those who think he should go to jail. Only a couple, only a couple. And I've, I've given that example before and then someone's put up their hand and said, oh, he didn't deliberately mean to kill his mates, which is a fair comment. Hands up those here who think someone who deliberately means to kill someone and does kill them, should go to jail. Absolutely. Look at all the hands go up. Absolutely. What about this situation? 80-year-old bloke, his wife is 75. They've been married for many, many, many years. He's never even got a parking ticket in his life. She is dying of the most incurable, painful cancer. She begs him every night to give her an overdose of her medication. He refuses until the pain gets too much for her. She again begs, he finally does, gives her an overdose of her medication. She dies in his arms with a smile on her face. He has tears running down his eyes. He has deliberately- Dude, like that's not even like- <laughs> he, he, has, he has deliberately killed her. Hands up those who think- he sh Hands up those who think he should go to jail. No one. So, so the point is that there are always different facts and circumstances of each case. Right? And we don't hear about that on the Channel 7 or the Channel 9 news. And that's why it's important people who want to do criminal psychology embark upon those courses because it is a way of addressing the underlying causes and researching why people commit offences. There is not a one-size-fits-all justice system and nor should there be. Judicial discretion and giving judges the power to decide cases and penalties based on the merits of the particular case is crucial. That's why I vehemently oppose mandatory sentencing, where we have this McDonald's one-size-fits-all approach where particular offences, you get this penalty, may as well just have a computer dishing out the sentences rather than independent people like uh, the Honourable Phil Cummins.
Um, just to add to my question, um, the reason why, because like, okay, so the reason why I'm a criminal psychologist is like my parents are all for it, like my family's all for it, but then it's kind of like, I don't know, like, it's like, do I want to do it? Because I'm scared of, like, like, if I end up, like, graduating from a degree and then I do it, and it's kind of like, oh, like, this is not what I want to do anymore. That makes sense. I suspect that all of us will start a career, but we won't be in that same career in 5, 10, 15 years' time. It's all part of life experience. If that's what you want to do now, you go for it. You go for it. And then you see whether or not you like it. The fact that you're qualified means it will qualify you for other positions in other career paths down the track. So don't be put off now by saying, oh, I'm, I want to do it now, but I'm not sure if I'll like it at the time. Taste it. Taste it and see. That's my advice. Up the back. All the time. Yep. Yeah. Often get worried about that. When you're representing somebody, you're standing up and... The difference between what you say or don't say can be the difference between the d difference between them going to jail or going home that night. Of course, you worry about it, absolutely. Um, but the reality is, you just have to do your best. Have passion, have commitment, work hard, work hard on the particular case, and do your best. Worry all the time. I used to worry all the time when I was in politics. Introducing particular laws, is this the right thing? When I introduced Curry Courts, I was slammed. Like a number of people said, this is outrageous, having specialist courts for Aboriginal people. You worry, am I doing the right thing? You know, Introducing a human rights charter, are you doing the right thing? Um, but you've got to stand by your commitment. You've got to believe in something, and then you work as hard as you can to achieve uh, an appropriate outcome. Uh, you can't spend your whole time worrying, um, but that doesn't mean you don't worry. Of course you worry, and letting people down, particularly as a lawyer, is something most lawyers worry about. Yep. Yes? Yeah, used to get lots of hate mail, used to get uh, the odd death threat, uh, used to, um, on my own time, I'm a Sorry, guys, but I'm a Mad Geelong supporter. Uh, I'd go to the footy on weekends and you'd have people coming up to you at the footy deliberately, because it was a big crowd, elbowing you, knocking into you. Uh, you knew that it was deliberate, but they could pretend because it was a big crowd, it was accidental. You used to get that on a, on a regular basis. Um, your first reaction is to strike back, uh, but then you realise, hang on, this will be a front page story in the Herald Sun, better not do that. Uh, so you've just got to be strong enough to ignore it. But the real answer to your question is if you have a firm belief in what you're doing and you really want to make a difference to people's lives, improve the lot of the most disadvantaged members of our community, you don't get put off. Right? Remember I said one of the messages, don't be put off by the doomsayers? What I was talking about then was the doomsayers in your life will tell you you're not good enough to do what you want to do. But it also applies to the work you're doing. If you believe that you're making a difference, there will always be doomsayers who'll say, what are you doing that for? What do you want a special blackfellas court? You know, uh, what do you want uh, to have a mental health court? If they're nuts and they commit an offence, they should be in jail anyway. What do you want to appoint more women to the bench for? You know, they're not up to it. Uh, the fact is, if you're passionate about making a difference, there will always be doomsayers in your life, particularly in the political arena. You just have to ignore them. It doesn't mean you ignore all the advice you get. Right? But there will always be people who will try and put you off, who will um, be those doomsayers who, whatever you do, won't be good enough for them. Just make sure you have a, a road map to achieve what you want to achieve and you go for it. There's always more that you can do. Um, and no, I didn't achieve everything I wanted to achieve. Uh, I wanted Curry Courts, for instance, to be, um, in effect, mainstream right across the state. They're only in certain areas. I wanted the Human Rights Charter, uh, which uh, enshrines civil and political rights to go even further and enshrines social and economic rights. Um, I wanted um, the Neighbourhood Justice Centre that I set up in Collingwood uh, to um, have 
a number of its cousins, like a number of neighbourhood justice centres right around Victoria. Um, I uh, wanted to uh, live in a community where um, there wouldn't be a media release put out um, saying another woman's been appointed to the bench. When a woman was appointed, it would just be accepted. Um, now we sort of got to that with women. So yeah, there was more I wanted to achieve, um, but it got to the stage where uh, I didn't want to um, have my last job being that of a politician. Uh, it was time to move on. You sort of know in your system when it's time to move on. And I thought I could do some good at RMIT University, offering you guys, um, lawyers and leaders of the future, some life-changing experiences, the sort of life-changing experiences I had. Yeah, I um, wanted to put in place uh, an instrument that would survive any government and hold future governments to account, right? And if we're fair income about living in a caring community, we have to respect and protect human rights of our citizens. And very few people knew that we actually didn't have in Victoria or in Australia a human rights instrument that sets out the rights that need to be protected and how they can be protected in legislation. So I got a number of people to um, consult with Victorians. They had barnyard meetings right around Victoria and regional Victoria and the cities and all that sort of stuff about what rights people want protected, wanted protected, how they wanted them protected. Um, and we had more submissions than anything I'd ever done. Like we just had huge feedback from the community saying they did want their civil and political rights protected. So I then went to my colleagues, my political colleagues, and said, I want to introduce a human rights charter in Victoria. Now, I'm not allowed to talk about what happens behind the cabinet doors, um, but if you repeat it, you know, I'll have to breach your human rights and kill you. Uh, I'm only joking. Uh, but um, there were a number of my colleagues who were vehemently opposed to a human rights charter. They thought it was an old-fashioned idea. And I said, hang on, this will hold future governments to account. It will change the way government operates. If government makes decisions based on protecting the human rights of its citizens, there'll be better decisions. If you're going to address a person's human rights before you actually introduce legislation, there'll be less challenges to that legislation. If the police act within a human rights framework, there'll be less bashings. There'll be less uh, inappropriate conduct by police. And so I finally got the support of most of my colleagues and was able to introduce the Human Rights Charter. Uh, let me tell you a funny story. When I retired from, I think it's funny, uh, when I retired from uh, politics, I got a number of letters from people saying, oh, congratulations, you've had a great career and all that sort of, and a number of my former colleagues wrote and said, and one of your lasting achievements uh, will be introducing the Human Rights Charter in Victoria. And I read their letter and I thought, you bastard, you opposed it. <laughs> and all of a sudden you're saying it's one of my lasting achievements. But uh, it has been um, uh, there since I introduced it. We've had changes of governments. Um, even conservative governments haven't got rid of it. So I think now it's a permanent part of the legal landscape here in Victoria. And I'm very proud of that. I just wish we had a federal human rights charter. And as part of my job at RMIT um, is meeting with various people to get a federal human rights charter up. Queensland are looking at having one. In fact, the Queensland government before the last election made a commitment to have one in Queensland. So I've been up there a bit, lobbying the government up there. Um, there are other, ACT has one, they were the first. Uh, and there are other jurisdictions that are looking at it. So hopefully it will be right around Australia in the not too distant future. Yeah, so we have ratified a number of United, Nation con not United Nations conventions, um, but it's not enough. Like, it's just not enough. Look what's happening with refugees, despite the fact that we're signatories to some charters. We need a federal human rights instrument. And as you know, as a nation, we parade around the world addressing other nations about their you know, human rights records and inappropriate human rights records, and yet we are one of the last nations in the Western world, in fact the last nation in the Western world that does not have a human rights instrument and we need one. We need one um, because 
It changes the culture of government. In fact, one of the biggest advocates for a human rights charter in Victoria, believe it or not, was the former Chief Commissioner of Police, Christine Nixon. Because uh, I've got a whole lot of charter champions out there lobbying the, um, on my behalf for a human rights charter. And she was of the view that if police act pursuant to a human rights charter, there'll be less civil actions, like the one I brought against the police in Queensland, less civil actions brought against the police, and that would be a good thing. Okay, so we have one last question. Last question. Yep, up the back. I think that um, our justice system uh, is moving towards a more uh, therapeutic, restorative model of justice, and it has to, because if we continue to go down this strict law and order path where we lock more and more people up and think it's going to make us safer as a community, we're kidding ourselves. It actually makes us less safe. Let me give you a quick example. Um, uh, young fella, six years jail for culpable driving. We've just conducted a restorative justice conference between the deceased, that is the dead man's sister, and the perpetrator, the guy that killed him, in jail. Okay? So the sister goes into jail, meets with the guy who actually killed uh, her brother, and they have a conference where she finds out about his background, about why the offence occurred, he finds out about how that death of her brother has impacted on her, and the outcome has been extraordinary. Extraordinary, where she has agreed to mentor this young kid when he gets, comes out of jail. He has agreed to volunteer at the same organisations as the guy he killed. The guy that he killed was an elderly ge gentleman, respecting the community, used to volunteer at a whole range of organisations. This kid, when he comes out of jail, has agreed to volunteer at those organisations. and. The woman, the victim, has agreed to be an advocate for prison reform because when this guy went into jail, he got six years jail, he enrolled in an alcohol and drug rehabilitation program. Five years later, he still hasn't received that program, right? Which means he probably won't get parole, which means he'll ultimately re be released into the community without any supervision. That doesn't make us safer as a community. So. The jobs you're talking about are crucial to ensure that a more holistic approach addressing the underlying causes of why people are coming into the, the justice system uh, are dealt with uh, much better than they are now. That's the only way we'll be much safer as a community. Not by locking more and more people up, because ultimately people come out unless we decide anyone who commits any offence gets locked up forever. No one's going to do that as a community. Ultimately, people come out unless they're getting the appropriate treatment, the appropriate assistance, appropriate assistance when they come out, we're not going to be safer as a community. So clinical psychologists, criminal psychiatrists, all that sort of stuff is all about addressing the underlying causes of why people come into contact with the justice system. Once you do that, you make us safer as a community.